Welcome to week three of our online academy. Today is a more practical session because I'm going to demonstrate how to do a supine evaluation and look at fixed versus flexible deformities in the spine. I'm also going to do an assessment around the hamstrings because this is a question that keeps coming up. So I'm going to demonstrate how to assess for hamstring range. So hope you enjoy it. And if you have any questions, please feel free to add them below. So the purpose of this short video is to demonstrate how to assess for fixed versus flexible deformities because we've been asked that question a number of times. So I'm going to start off with the kyphosis and then I'm going to do the uh, lordosis and then the scoliosis and we'll work through how to assess fixed versus flexible. Now the most important thing when you're doing an assessment for fixed versus flexible is to eliminate gravity. So you need to do the assessment in supine. So this is where the person is lying flat on the bed because when the person is sitting up, gravity is taking over and it's very difficult to assess if something is fixed or flexible. So I'm going to start to demonstrate the kyphotic curve or the kyphosis. Uh, so if someone is demonstrating a kyphotic curve, when they're lying in bed, they may need two or maybe even three pillows to support the spine. So when we take the pillows out, what we want to do is we want to see how much support they need. Does the spine come in contact with the surface below? So can I take out these pillows and do I get contact with the surface below? Then I want to ask myself, if I can't, how many pillows do I need to support the upper part of the spine. And this is going to indicate to me that when I sit this person up, how much head and neck support the person is going to need. That's going to indicate if that is fixed or flexible. So what I want to demonstrate here is the scoliosis. And a scoliosis is a curvature of the spine. And Louise is doing her best to demonstrate this. Uh, obviously, this is not uh, Louise's normal posture. So what we've got here, when we've got a scoliosis, very often we also have a hip rotation. And in a rotation, you can see that one ASIS is more forward than the other. So if you are assessing this patient, you will have to find the ASIS. And what you want to see is, can I correct this posture? So Louise is going to demonstrate a fixed posture and I'm going to try and correct this. And that is not possible to correct. Now Louise is going to demonstrate a flexible posture where I'm going to try to correct this. And if I can correct this, then this is going to demonstrate to me that this is not a fixed posture. So Louise, just come back into that posture. So when I have the client in, in supine, I want to see, can I line up the shoulders and the pelvis? Is it possible to correct that? Or are they in a fixed position? So if you go back to fixed, if I was trying to correct that posture and not fix, it would be practically impossible to do that. So this is going to demonstrate the fixed versus the flexible posture in scoliosis. I just want to point out hip rotation again. Hip rotation is when one ASIS is forward and the other is back. And if you see the person in supine, you will notice that they're not taking weight through one side of the body because the hips are rotating that way and they're not taking weight evenly. I want to find out, is this correctable or is this something I need to accommodate within the chair? With the hip rotation, you'll probably notice a leg length discrepancy while the person is seated. So again, in supine, can I correct this? And is the weight being taken evenly through both sides of the body? The next posture I want to show you is the lordosis or the lordotic curve. So when someone's sitting in a chair and they have, they're demonstrating a lordosis, when we put them in the bed, in the supine position, we want to see can we, if we can get our hand right underneath the lumbar area, this is going to indicate that there's a fixed lordotic curve here. If the pelvis is in contact with the bed, like that, that means that gravity has eliminated the posture and it is there for a flexible posture. So is the spine in contact with the surface? If it is, that means that the lordosis is flexible. Following on from the lordosis, I just want to say that when someone is sitting in a lordosis, very often it's associated with anterior tilt when the weight is going through the pubic region. 
So this is why it's important when we put someone in the supine position, we want to see is it flexible or is it something that we need to accommodate when the person is in an upright position. If we cannot get our hand underneath this lumbar region, um, that means that the client may well be sitting in a very posterior pelvic tilt where the pelvis is tilted right back. So in that case, the ASIS are very high compared to the PSIS. So again, it's really important when you're doing your assessment that you have hands on and that you are actually palpating and feeling the pelvis and establishing where the ASIS are. Are they level? Are they rotated? Or are they forward or back? Just to complete this video, I want to demonstrate one more thing and that is how to assess for hamstrings in the supine position. So when we're assessing for hamstrings, we always ensure that we have the hip flexed. So we want to flex the hip, find the most comfortable position for the client, so don't over flex. Keep your finger on the ASIS or your thumb on the ASIS and make sure that we're not over flexing the hip. So once I've achieved flexion, I want then to see how much extension I can achieve at the knee without causing tension. And what I would do there is I would hold my thumb on the ASIS and as I extend the knee, I'm going to feel a movement there. And that tells me that the pelvis is moving down the chair. And that's the, what that is in sitting is, that's you elevating the leg rest too much and pulling the pelvis down the chair. So I want to go right back to that position and then this is the angle that I need to set the foot plate at. Because if I overextend the hamstrings, I'm going to pull the pelvis down the seat. So just to recap, keep your thumb on the ASIS and when you feel the pelvis moving, that's when you know that you've overextended and you've gone too far. I think it's important to point out that when you're doing a supine evaluation, it should be a firm surface or a plinth, not an alternating air mattress. In fact, this mattress may be a little bit soft, so a firm surface is always much better. I also would like to point out that if we accommodate or we facilitate the posture in seating, it's also very important that we offer 24 hour postural support. Because if someone sits all day in a chair and they're well supported, if you're putting them in bed at night, think about 24 hour postural management and think about maybe using a sleep system to support that body. So if it's fixed or flexible, that it is supported 24 hours. So we've had a lot of questions about how to assess for hamstrings. So I'm going to demonstrate this here today. Um, I also want to do it on the side of the bed or on a plank because I think that's much better. Now, if you're doing an assessment on a plinth or on the side of the bed, it's really important that the feet are loaded. Either you lower the bed down, but make sure that the feet are loaded when you're doing an assessment on the side of the bed or on a plinth. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to test the hamstring range. And like I said in the supine evaluation, the most important thing is we must do is we have to locate the ASIS. And these are the two bony prominences right at the front of the um, iliac crest. So we're going to locate that. And I'm going to hold my hand there. And what I want to do with the hip flexed, I want to see how much range of movement I can get at the knees without causing any uh, resistance. So when I hold my finger on the ASIS, as I extend the knee, I will notice the pelvis coming forward if I go outside the range that's comfortable for the patient or if I'm putting on too much pressure or too much resistance. So I want to just see how far can I extend the leg and this is going to indicate to me where I must set the foot plate on the chair. I will demonstrate this in the chair later. So the important thing is, just to recap, locate the ASIS Hold your thumb on the ASIS on the side that you are assessing and then you want to see how much range of movement you can get here at the knee without causing resistance, without pulling the pelvis forward. And the important thing is that you assess both sides because both sides may not necessarily be the same. So you always assess both sides. 
So now I've got Louise on the chair and I just want again to demonstrate the hamstrings in the chair. So um, again, I want to locate the ASIS and feel what position they're in. I'm going to hold my finger here, my thumb, sorry, I'm going to hold my thumb here and I'm going to bring the leg into extension and don't bring it past the point of resistance. So if the pelvis starts moving forward, well then I need to bring the leg back. So this is going to indicate to me where I set the leg rest on the chair. And for people with tight hamstrings, the leg rest should be adjustable so that you can accommodate it at different positions depending on the range of movement at the hamstrings. Now in this particular chair, we can get the foot pit into a negative angle. So we can come right back in, which is going to accommodate someone who's got very tight hamstrings. So we need to bring the foot pit right back on in. In an earlier presentation, I mentioned that the hamstrings go over two joints. They go over the hip joint and the knee joint. Now we have shown you here how you can accommodate at the knee joint by having a negative angle on the calf pad or by adjusting the foot plate. But it's also important that all clinical therapeutic seating has a back angle recline. And we're going to open up the back angle of the chair. And by doing this, we are accommodating the hamstrings in the hip joint as well. And so every clinical therapeutic seating should really have a back angle recline because you need to have the back angle of the chair must match the angle of the hip. So that takes us to the end of this week's webinar. If you have any questions, please submit them below. Or if you have any suggestions for future seminars, please let us know. If you need clarification on anything we've discussed, please get in touch.